Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to this morning's session on peer support for developing and accelerating affiliate fundraising. Um, I'm Amy Fowler. I work in major gifts fundraising at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so we're going to do just, um, I'm going to start with a very quick overview of funding uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation. From there, we'll talk about how some of the, their areas of similarity with affiliate fundraising. Then uh, Jenny Brandt from Wikimedia Sweden will talk about uh, some learnings from what they do in fundraising. Then I'll be back uh, to talk about how the foundation is planning to support affiliate fundraising and introduce uh, a new colleague that you'll all be very excited about. Um, and then on to Yulia and Jenny to talk about the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising group. Then um, Valentina from Wikimedia Europe isn't here, but Yulia is, and so she's going to uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, Wikimedia Europe from Valentina's slides. Um, and then we'll have lots of time for discussion and questions at the end as well. Right. Um, so, hey. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the slides, but they're all online for you to look at, um, so you can always go back to them. Um, the first thing to say is just ooh, the, the foundation is really fortunate and honored to have uh, such a global spread um, and a really massively diverse donor base. So we currently run active campaigns in 36 countries, and we have donations that come in from over 200 countries. So you can see them all here um, and where, where the main sources of revenue are worldwide. So this is a slide that I think... Uh, is interesting for us here to discuss because you can see where the foundation's income comes from. Um, and there are some things that aren't applicable here to uh, affiliate fundraising, but there are a lot of things that are as well. So obviously the um, desktop banners and mobile banners aren't um, applicable to a lot of affiliates, but uh, email, major gifts, recurring donations, a lot of this um, are things that we can explore in affiliate fundraising as well. Right. Um, so one in particular that I wanted to talk about, uh, and this was just a big area that uh, we focused on in this last fiscal year, was the growth in recurring donations. So uh, you can see we had a 20% increase in our recurring donations over this past year, and this was uh, a really deliberate um, move that we at the foundation made and uh, led by a wonderful colleague named Mariana Seikerbeck, um, who made a lot of uh, changes. So we, we started doing things like asking people to convert their one-time gift into a recurring donation, just as easy as that after they give on the thank you page. Um, a lot of just actively asking for recurring donations instead of uh, the one-time gift as well. And it has really massively paid off. Um, so I'm going to move on. Um, here's some just uh, things that we've done differently over this past year, uh, increasing um, payment options. Um, changing the um, security parameters and, and things like that. That's about all I'm going to say about these things, and I'm going to hand it over to Wikimedia Sweden. But um, at the end, we will have questions and discussions, and we can talk about any of the things that, that we've just talked about here as well. Thanks. So um, we are, uh, I am Jenny from Wikimedia Sweden. And I am going to, as you know, uh, each chapter and the organization within the Wikimedia movement can uh, do their own fundraising. So we have been working with testing different kinds of ways to fundraise for, the, for Wikimedia Sweden specifically. So what we did during 2023 was that we had a short campaign on the streets of Stockholm and Uppsala, which is a smaller town in Sweden, uh, to try and see what scripts, what, how we can talk to people to get the message across, what we want, what we, that they're more behind the Wikimedia movement than just Wikipedia, or basically that it, there is more behind Wikipedia than just Wikipedia, because in our countries, most people don't know that there is an organization behind it. So we tested this by using uh, recruiters on the street. Uh, and this is, of course, not a very usual campaign for maybe the Wikimedia movement because we're on an online-based uh, organization. So this was really new. And that was also something that reflected in re the results that we are, as Wikipedia, on the streets. Uh, we tried to, I mean, everyone has probably met canvassers, recruiters, uh, 
on the streets, and maybe they are not always liked, uh, if, you, if I can say it like that. So we tried to make sure that we were standing on, we, we placed the recruiters, and I was myself out, we were placing ourselves and the recruiters on places where we thought that maybe people that are interested in the Wikimedian themes would be, or would walk by. So for example, we were standing outside of museums, we were standing outside of uh, some schools, but this was during the summer, so a lot of the schools were, of course, not uh, occupied by students. Uh, and we also stood near, near events. Uh, so we tried this, and what we learned was that this was, a, it was really good because we could find a way to shortcut to people's interests uh, as quickly as possible. Because when you're talking to people, most people are, they want to know how their interests can be applied in the organization, or how do my interests fit into this organization. And this, this shortcut, be, by be standing on the streets outside of a library, for example, we, when we were standing outside of the library, we were talking about a, a project that Wikimedia Sweden ran with high schools, where high school students could write on Wikipedia, and uh, the library and the museums were helping the students. So this was kind of a shortcut. Unfortunately, we weren't able to be placed in every day in, in, that, in those kind of locations. So we were also in the hands of just trying to find people and trying to get them to stop by just the brand. And we realized very quickly that the brand Wikipedia is what's going to get people to stop. We were trying to test, you know, like stoppers, like, have you heard about, uh, about this Wiki, Wikigap, for example? Have you heard about a wiki speech, have you heard about different projects that we ran just to get them to stop? But we realized that very quickly, in order to get to talk about these subjects that the Wikimedia Sweden is organizing, we need to open up with Wikipedia because that is what people are interested in. And we also got so many comments uh, from our merch. Merch maybe is not the same. The material that we were using, we had we had the Wikimedia Sweden logo on the front and Wikipedia on the back. So there were so many people that were stopping because I was looking at my recruiters and they were with the backs, as so I saw their backs, so I saw people walking, turning and go going back because they saw the Wikipedia logo. So in an environment that is um, very stressful that maybe other organization has uh, saturated the market, Wikimedia, Wikipedia, was a new face on the market. And, and also, everyone used Wikipedia, obviously, we know that. So people were interested in, in talking with someone that actually maybe had some answers to all of their questions. Usually it was, why can I, how can I edit? I saw something that was wrong in this Wikipedia article. But this gave us a, such a great way into talking about Wikipedia and that there is an organization behind it and all the projects that we are using or that we are doing. Um, so, for example, we were, we were talking about the wiki gap, for example, when we had spoken with them about the usual Wikipedia question, which was really fun, we quickly led them into trying to get them to know, at least know about that there is an organization behind it that in Sweden, for example, that you can donate to. So obviously the main goal was to, to test different scripts and see how it went, but also to recruit new members. So we got like, I think we got 34 members in, totals, in total. And we were talking, I don't have the hours here, but it was a, quite a good result, result. It was like one member an hour by the best recruiter because having recruiters on the street is also uh, difficult because it's very new, new to them. So, so it was a good result, but I do think that moving forward, we need to, to be, we need to stand in places that are connected to our projects. We need to look at what projects does Wikimedia Sweden have and maybe not recruit during the summer when there is a lot of tourists there, and then stand in specific places that are connected to these projects. For example, free music. We did something with the, 
with a music uh, part of the government, and we we uh, were we could use that and stand outside of a school with the musical high school or something, uh, just to be able to connect to the people that are working by. So the main uh, the main result that we have that we got was to. We can't remove Wikipedia, but we can use it so that we can talk more about the, Wikim the Wikimedia projects that we have in each country. Uh, yes, that is. I, um, should we ask? So, I, wait, sorry, can I ask? We have a colleague here. Do you want to add something now or do you want to? Uh, Maybe later. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Uh, my first job in fundraising was a face-to-face -face on the street fundraiser, and that's, it's hard. <laughs> so well done. Uh, so what's the Wikimedia Foundation doing to support affiliate fundraising? Uh, I am super excited uh, to introduce Siri Oldervik here. Siri, can you stand up for a second? Thank you. Um, Siri is our new affiliate fundraising training consultant, um, and she started on Monday, so she is brand new, um, and we are super delighted that she's able to come uh, this week and meet a lot of you and um, just to, to meet with us. Um, Siri's going to be working in the major gifts team, um, but also with accountability to the community growth team. Um, Siri, do you feel comfortable giving just a, a little brief bio of, of yourself? Yeah. Sorry, I've totally put her on the spot here. I didn't ask her to do this before. No worries. Um, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Siri, and I very recently joined the team, so very, very new. Monday was super intense. It was my first day. We were having like an offsite with the team, and I met so many people, but it's been, it's been great. Everyone's been super lovely, and I'm feeling very warmly welcome, and I'm super excited to get started. I'm originally from Norway slash Denmark, um, but live a bit all over as I mostly travel and work remotely. And I come from a background of doing fundraising across a lot of different things like high net individuals, corporations, foundations, government funding, the whole nine yards, mainly in the Red Cross. Um, and then I kind of pivoted into consulting and I've been working across a number of tech for good startups and various NGOs. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Siri. Thank you. Um, so Siri is so new that when we put together the slides over a week ago, she didn't have an email address yet. So her email address is not on uh, the slides, but uh, Yulia's is. And so if you want to connect with Siri after this as well, you can email Yulia and then she'll uh, connect you. Um, so some of the things, oh, firstly, just wanted to say um, that you know, Siri has this wealth of knowledge um, in fundraising and in community relations as well. Um, so her, uh, the, the selection process um, had fundraisers from the foundation, community growth people from the foundation, and also affiliate uh, executive directors. So we tried to get a really representative um, selection panel for, for choosing her as well, and we are just super delighted that you're here. Um, so I just some of the things um, that she will and won't be doing. Um, so Siri is here uh, to advise, um, to do training. Um, she's not here to fundraise for anybody. Um, she's here to help um, you kind of supercharge your own fundraising. So some of the things, um, especially mid-level and major gift fundraising, um, she can help uh, with strategy development for grant writing more broadly. Um, lots of fundraising techniques and methods and stewardship best practices um, lots of the systems and setting things up behind the scenes that we all know goes along with fundraising um, it's never just the ask in the room is it there's um, a lot of systems that have to go behind that and siri can talk to you about all of that and the frameworks and the policies and all of these kinds of things that are important for for sustainable fundraising um, also um, Siri, in uh, conjunction with Yulia and others, uh, will um, be working on the, the peer sharing facilities and forums um, and, and liaising between all of the affiliates as well, um, trying to understand um, what's working one place that she might hear about that she can help um, connect people and share as well. 
Um, so to the timeline, obviously, series brand new. So um, the, uh, the first month is going to be scoping, meeting people, trying to understand where the needs are, where the biggest needs are, um, where the, the most impact could be had as well. And this is a, an initial one year uh, term that, that we're going to, we're trying this and we're going to see how it works. Um, so by the end of the year, uh, we are hoping that, um, you know, we will we'll discuss this with all of you and see what's worked and what hasn't and, and what more we could do, but also hopefully where the big wins have been. And um, and then we'll report back to, to all of you and to the wider foundation as well, how that's gone. All right. Um, then I'm going to pass over uh, to Yulia and Jenny, I think. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yulia Bruns. I work for the foundation as a community relations specialist between the fundraising team and the communities. And you've already met Jenny. Jenny so um, we're here today to talk about the peer fundraising group, which is an informal group. Jenny is a member, Jacek is a member, I'm seeing that. Don't think anyone else is here, sadly, but uh, not everyone could make it. Um, if we look at the next slide. So this is basically an informal group where we invite the affiliate fundraisers in Europe to come together once a quarter, roughly. And we just have a call for an hour and a half, talk about a certain topic, which gets decided on the call before everyone brings their expertise, what they're doing in the area. They also bring questions, so some people might be like, I really don't know what to do. Does chapter X do something with this and can you help me? So it's a very informal and supportive group. We're currently branching out, so Brazil is gonna join us, which is great. So uh, less than, more than Europe. And this is also an invitation. If in your region you'd like to do something similar, get in touch and I'm happy to set you, help you set it up. It might be better to have someone else regionally coordinated, especially when it's a language thing. Like if you want to do something in Latin America, it might be better to do it in Spanish than in English. And I don't, and I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> so obviously we would need someone in Spanish leading that. But I'm happy to help with the logistics and with the frameworking to workshop it with you and set it up. I'm also we're always happy to welcome new people into this group in Europe. So if you want to join and you don't know how quite to join us, Come to me afterwards. My email is on the last slide as well. So um, all of these things are open. This is an open, informal group for all, everyone. And yeah, just a skill exchange. Do you want to add anything? <clears throat> yeah, I can, I can add that there is also, I mean, there are, the, there, there are certain people that are always there, but depending on the subjects, there are people yeah. popping in and and uh, maybe not intending the next time. So if, for example, we have communication people that can join if there are specifics, yeah. not only fundraising, but other specifics. But it's really nice and really open for discussion and you don't always have to present if you're feeling yes. nervous. And uh, yeah, and if you don't have anything, just listen. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's very open and friendly and everyone should join if they want. So please join us. Uh, am I the next part as well? Yes, I'm also Wikimedia Europe today. <laughs> so Valentina had to leave, but she left us some slides, so I'm just going to quickly go through them. There are quite details and there are speaker notes as well. So if you go into the event on Eventier, you see the presentation and there you can follow um, what Valentina shared with us. And she also shared her email address on her last slide, so you can reach out to her directly or to me and I will get you in touch. But she had to leave early, so she apologizes. Um, so Wikimedia Europe, who are they? They're established in 2023. They foster collaboration between European Wikimedians. Quite a few of you might be involved with Wikimedia Europe. And they provide a public voice for advocating for public interest internet in Europe. They're 29 members. They go further than the EU. They're a Council of Europe based. So from Norway to Malta and Portugal to Georgia. I should have worn my glasses. <laughs> um, the core activities are policy and advocacy, they do fundraising and training and capacity building. The, uh, the fundraising support they provide is the incubated proposals aligned with the purpose of the mandate. Um, they work with fundraising policy to optimize that support and they offer ad hoc support for members as needed through assessments. They focus on European Union funding, so there's a uh, Erasmus Plus is an example, the ad hoc session they did on that. They are individualized the personalized support for members for specific opportunities around EU funding. They have a repository for expression of interest in order to coordinate EU funding across the region. 
and they, they uh, support members for joint funding opportunities. So what's next? The, there's a structure of offer that includes the, a digest of funding opportunities, the support in creating synergies between members and partners, advice on relevant EU calls and other opportunities, the connection to specialized support, advice on partnership composition, and the capacity building and peer learning opportunities. Wikimedia Europe is also part of our peer-to-peer -peer call, so Valentina is usually there. Um, so if you want to know more, please reach out to Valentina. As said, the presentation is in the event yet. This is her email address, and I'm also happy to make the connection if you would like to. Thank you. And now I hand it back to... to that one? Cool. And then I hand it back to Jenny and Amy. Yeah. Wait for you to get the... You got it. Okay. Right, um, and now it's over to you. So uh, hopefully we've given you an overview, um, but now we'd really like to hear from you. Uh, are there things that you want to ask about what we've talked about or other things entirely that you'd like to, to talk about and share either from hearing from people in the room or from any of us? Yes, um, do we have a microphone though? Thanks. Just in case people are watching online or want to watch it back later, we would like to. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, Pasita Vada, Wikimedia New York City. I was just curious, we heard a lot of examples from Europe, but are there any examples from North America, Africa, Latin America that we can look to? And then I also had a question about um, affiliates that don't have a huge staff team, right? Thinking about myself, I just started as the executive director of Wikimedia New York City. I've only been on for four months, but I'm the only full-time staff person. Yeah. And so it's a little bit more challenging to run the organization and also think about fundraising. So what resources or capacity building exists for smaller affiliates? Yeah, great question. Um, do you want to talk, does anybody here want to talk about from other, uh, other regions, case studies from other regions or, yeah? yeah. So as I said, the peer group is focused on Europe, as Europe is currently the most mature market. We haven't reached out to North America. I'm happy to set something up there to gather examples and get to the local affiliates there together. I know there's many more city-orientated chapters there. Um, we don't have a huge amount of examples from outside Europe at the moment. This is something, yes, we're welcome to collect and um, with encouraging maybe these peer groups to like broaden out into different regions, that would be a good space to collect them and encourage more um, but yeah, Europe is a focus because it's the most mature market to be also generate resources outside the foundation. Yeah. Um, and then to your question about smaller affiliates, um, I think there are a lot who are in your same position where there's one or none um, full-time staff members. And I know that fundraising is a takes a huge amount of time um, to, to do in addition to all of the other things that you're doing. So totally get it that that's, that's tricky. That is something that we're gonna be looking into and part of you know series role is about different resources that you could access as a small affiliate um, without a full-time fundraiser on staff. Um, there is an extent to which it's just, it, because she's not going to be fundraising for people that um, it is about are you in a position, you know, part of what um, we talk about is who is in a position to fundraise. Um, and sometimes you have to say, I actually can't fulfill that application or, or the terms of that, that report because it's only me, right? Um, and I've been there before as well, actually, where I've been, you know, the one, the one person and it is so difficult to juggle. Um, so yeah, um, I think that that's something that I would love to talk about further and see um, if, more than us saying, here's what's available, um, what you want, what's useful to you. Um, yeah, I, that's what I'd love to hear. Yeah. Do you have any ideas about what might be useful? Um, yeah, literally. <laughs> um, so you said everything, but yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, clearly, sorry, can we get the mic back? Thank, thank you so much. Clearly, we need more capacity, right, to be able to do the fundraising, because one person can't do everything. Right. Um, so what resources are available for that, whether that's you know, sharing staff with the, the foundation and smaller affiliates mm -hmm. or, you know, thinking through financial support to 
bring on consultants to support affiliates with fundraising, um, and then just capacity building, right? Like trainings and all of that kind yeah. of stuff too. But yeah, any support I think is welcome. Great, thank you. Um, and yeah, I, as as the year goes on and we've got Siri and, and we're trying to think about this, I would love to hear more from you and others about what would be useful here, um, what we can do, and especially like, which trainings um, beyond having somebody, because I agree, if we could just give you a person to do your fundraising, that would be great, but um, we can't do that for, for everybody. So um, like what we can do that's sustainable as well. Um, yeah, anybody else questions? Thank you. Uh, thanks, folks. My, I'm Freddie uh, with Wikitongues, and I am very interested to hear about the uh, canvassing tactic in relation to the portfolio of possible uh, avenues for fundraising. And looking at that beautiful pie chart, what we see between emails and banners, it's something like half, right? Um, how how does the ROI for canvassing ultimately like? How can you how does that strategy show up <laughs> being so hard and expensive, I imagine, in comparison to the rest? Or are you maybe recruiting other, other kinds of support, maybe memberships or something? I'd love to hear the, the, the thought process around all that. So if I understand you correctly, how, how we came to choose that, that uh, method of fundraising. We, well, basically, it was because I, my background is in face-to-face -face fundraising. I've been doing this with, for 10 years with Amnesty Sweden. Uh, so my, we thought that with my experience we could try um, doing a very short limited project within Wikimedia Sweden. But I was also very, very... Uh, I told them that this is a very expensive uh, way of recruiting. So we this that that is why it is a lot, it was like a test campaign and also one of the main goals was to make Wikimedia Sweden more visible by talking to people. So we also looked at how many people are, were we talking to. We were talking to 219. I I need to check the. I didn't uh, I didn't want to overwhelm you with the numbers since I didn't have them up on the screen, but. But I can definitely give you the numbers that we have because we have everything uh, in the computer. Uh, but it is, yeah, it is expensive, and we're not certain that we are going to do it. But continue doing it unless it is very, very specifically connected to a certain place that we know uh, the people that are there. Because just standing outside on the street wasn't really uh, helpful for us. We did get some really good results, but it was results that we can use forward. But one of them, them was that we are not going to stand working on the street, but we are going to use the results um, to move the, them to other ways of fundraising. Uh, because we know that even though we are on the, we have an ad campaign, we need to maybe use Wikipedia to get people interested and then go into detail what we are doing as um, Wikimedia Sweden. But no, we are not going to continue uh, doing it the same way because it wasn't, it was, it is really expensive having people on the streets. Yeah, so yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Douglas from the user group in Uganda. So just like Wikimedia Europe, uh, we are, I represent and we are part of the East African Regional Thematic Hub. And uh, resources, like financial resources, are one of the things that we, for us, so that we would need. It's in the, in, in the research results that we, we, we shared from our needs assessment. Mm -hmm. And as we are pl pilot, planning to pilot implementation, I don't know, uh, in the future, you might need a fundraising plan or strategy. So I'm wondering um, what advice or what guidelines would we need to follow um, as harbors or as the region in case we wanted to approach funding. Then secondly, I think it might be a guideline. I noticed that um, for the first step, you followed the fundraising policies. I don't know if these, these are only relevant to the foundation policies or the fundraising policies of the fundraising policies in the EU in general. So in case we were to follow that route, 
would we as well need to look at the fundraising policies in our region as we plan to implement this? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just to make sure that I'm uh, understanding your question, um, you're asking one um, about fundraising strategy development and then two about uh, policies and, and which policies you might need to think about. Is that, is that right? Okay, thank you. Um, so fundraising strategies, um, this is something that uh, Siri is going to be uh, advising on for, for people. Um, it's something that, oh, <laughs> oh God, um, Cinderella. Um, it, it's something that is so individualized for each affiliate or hub. Um, and it's absolutely something that you need if you're going to start fundraising more widely. And it's something that is very easy to skip um, when you just want to jump in and start fundraising, right? You just want to start asking people for things. But if you take the time up front and, and really try and work out um, often a fundraising strategy will have um, where you think your your funding is going to come from, the different sources. So is it going to be high net worth individuals? Is it going to be community fundraising? Is it going to be trusts and foundations? Um, just the, the different types. And so you kind of know what you're, um, what you're aiming for. Um, it also will have things like helping you develop uh, what fundraisers call a case for support. So um, what is it about you that is compelling to people um, beyond the, the Wikimedia, Wikipedia brand? Um, what is it about um, Wikimedia Uganda or, or the East African hub that, um, that is compelling and engaging for donors to want to give to specifically. Um, so yeah, um, there's, there's a lot that we can say about this. And, and this is the kind of thing where um, I, I, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is creating resources that everybody could use. So even if it's not, um, you know, a one, one on one where Siri sits with you and helps you or anybody sits with you and helps you develop a strategy where we have documents and trainings available on creating your own strategy. And then we could have potentially workshops where we bring our strategies and talk about them and um, see, you know, where, where things might need more development as well. Um, secondly, on policies, um, there's a lot of policies that if you start going for things like trust and foundation fundraising or even high net worth individuals often will ask for specific policies. And so um, part of major gifts fundraising in particular is about making sure that you have all of the things you need before you get started so that you're not caught out when somebody says, could you send us your ethical fundraising policy? And you're like, oh, better write one of those. Um, so um, it, there is a lot of these that are standard. And um, again, we can have uh, trainings on exactly what you want to have in place before you start pursuing this kind of, of fundraising. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to say on that? No? Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, hey, I'm Jacek from Wikimedia Poland, and I have a question because um, we are struggling in Wikimedia Poland uh, with system for CRM. Uh, we don't have it. We use uh, now the free version of Salesforce mm -hmm. for uh, non-profit organizations, yeah. but it's tough uh, because it's not uh, personalized and so on. Uh, and I'm uh, wondering if uh, the Wikimedia Foundation have plans. I heard somewhere that uh, Wikimedia Foundation have plans to create a, uh, such CRM for um, Wikimedia Foundation and chapters or so on, or if not, uh, if you will consider that, because the manage of our peers, of our supporters, uh, in one place will be the, uh, I think, the big help for uh, for chapters mm. uh, to manage the fundraising campaign and uh, stay in touch with uh, our our supporters. Thank you very much for the question. Um, CRMs are such a um, for people who don't know, it's a, a database for you to manage your, your contacts and your stakeholders. Um, it's such a, like every fundraising position I've had, you like, got to sort out the CRM for, for, the, first, uh, for the first bit. Um, so totally understand Salesforce is a difficult one if it's not custom built bespoke for your um, organization. Absolutely, so expensive. Um, there are a lot of others out there, but I, I totally get where you're coming from on this. In terms of uh, if we're planning on creating one, I, Peter, do you have any <laughs> insight into that? Um, There's a mic right beside oh, you, actually. Sorry. 
Thank you. Hello? Um, yes, I believe there's a, uh, a CRM being created for volunteer nice. contacts. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to include affiliates in that way. Uh, I think Kim Gill is the person to speak to about that. Uh, and um, in terms of what we use for fundraising, we use Civi CRM. We actually have a, uh, a contractor who works on that full time, basically. Uh, and is an expert in Civi CRM, so like we can help yeah. you if anyone's using that already or is interested in that. I'm sure. Thank you. Sorry, Peter. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm Peter. I'm a lead developer on the online fundraising team at the foundation. Thanks. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So uh, we actually just we're going to use the Salesforce now. So I would love to speak to you about that. <laughs> so we can. Well, we're going to have an implementation partner help us. Customized, so we can. I don't know. Well, let's talk more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm wondering. What do you think about if, if you're asking, um, you know, if it's something that we could consider? What sounds most useful to you? Is it something that everybody shares? All the affiliates share, or is it um, Wikimedia Poland has an instance? Um, Wikimedia New York City has an instance that it's all. Um, but kind of overseen by the foundation. Just wondered if you had thoughts. Uh, sorry, can we get the microphone? Sorry, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so um, when I think about the CRM, uh, the main thing that I have in my mind is that uh, the customizations and uh, the usefulness of uh, CRM um, tools mm -hmm. because uh, when we have uh, now I'm working on uh, the free version of uh, Salesforce. Uh, okay, I have my uh, contact base. I can um, put up the, some data from this, but uh, it's not connected with uh, email uh, system. It's not have a good uh, connection between. Uh, uh, contacts and uh, their history and so on. Um, so I think rather that the CRM, uh, based on uh, sharing knowledge, what is the useful things that the uh, Wikimedia Foundation or chapters use in the CRM to engage the fundraising. So we just make some uh, default uh, CRM that have some uh, useful tools, useful mm. topics, useful connections with uh, and how it's done, uh, and uh, customize for uh, for fundraising because uh, the free version is. Uh, I am not developer. I don't have knowledge from uh, for, for for the um, coding and so on. So uh, I haven't done anything more that I have from this uh, free version. So, uh, but I know that the. Um, it's a lot, a lot of for, for possibilities to uh, customize the size for us. You can uh, create the, your dashboard that you have the whole uh, data about your fundraising, uh, the automation like uh, uh, rem remembering like okay, this and this contact uh, don't um, that was your recurring donation. Stop your uh, stop the payments. You can. Uh, a message like okay, you can uh, contact with them and so on and so on. So this is the uh, very useful thing. Uh, but um, I think the collaboration for chapters and the Wikimedia Foundation to create such a CRM um, that is um, open for everybody, every chapter. That will I think this kind will be great because the sharing knowledge will. will uh, can avoid a lot of problems to solving the, ourselves uh, mm -hmm. with uh, CRM. So, yeah. Thank you for that. It's something that I think um, might be a, a long-term goal, um, but I wonder if in the short, medium term is, you know, could we add this to the peer-to-peer, the -peer either um, Europe or, or wider, um, other, you know, affiliate forums that we are, are creating? Um, yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, it, it, and just to say, I think CRMs are, um, like even at the foundation where we, I think, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that we are the largest instance of, C of CIVI CRM um, worldwide, right? So we have the biggest uh, instance of it. 
and we have a full-time member of staff who deals with it. And even in the major gifts team, we have a member of staff who deals with our, you know, um, and it's still not what everything that we need it to be. And we're still every day saying, oh, I wish that it could do this and we could customize it like that. And um, we are lucky that, you know, some of, we can implement some of these things, but I feel like CRMs are that constant um, <laughs> thing that we're all trying to get right um, and iterating and iterating. So yeah. Yeah. So um, in the um, ending of my uh, thoughts, that uh, I think with the CRM and uh, after our uh, talks in uh, our peer support, uh, is uh, two main uh, problems. One is the money for the <laughs> CRM yeah. and customize because we have we can have the free versions of. Um, CRM, but uh, the problem is the money for customization. Uh, in uh, Poland, we, if you want to customize uh, CRM, is about uh, fifteen thousand euros, something like that. Fifteen, it's the lowest, uh, lowest, lowest price. Uh, so for us, it's a uh, very big um, money. And or the this is the one problem. And the second problem is the technical uh, experience to do, deal with that because right. we can deal with the, this in on our own, but we don't have the the, the skills and uh, or any people that have the skills. So uh, maybe this is a good idea for or just mm -hmm. create some grant proposal for uh, chapters for uh, supporting the funding for uh, for individual uh, customizations for CRM or just uh, share this uh, share this your uh, staff member for the uh, <laughs> chapters thank you um, I have a question about overlapping fundraising so just thinking about the you know, I have a list of funders and foundations and folks that I want to contact, but then I'm wondering, are you also contacting them on behalf of the foundation, um, especially in New York City where there's tons of yeah. funders, right? So what are the communications channels between the foundation and affiliates around fundraising so that we're not competing against each other for the same grants? Yeah, I think that's a really great question um, and something that I think... Uh, we need to, to think about further. Um, so, and that's, again, something that um, we're hoping to look into more. Can, can you speak about what, what you would like to see happen with that? Um, just because you know, with data protection and all of that, it's not, we legally wouldn't be able to say, here's our list of donors and we don't want to overlap with you, but also logistically would be very difficult every time one of us wants to contact somebody to say, are you, um, right, so, do you have ideas for, for how we could manage this? I mean, my idea was what you said you can't do. Oh, <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> it's like, it'd be helpful to know, right? Like, yeah. who are you already funded by, right? Yeah. Who are you in conversation with? Yeah. So then we can avoid yeah. those um, folks. There are, so the people who have chosen to be publicly named, you can see online on, our, on the benefactors page. So anybody that gives over $1,000, we ask them if they want to be publicly named. And there's a big page of them online. Um, both to the endowment and to the foundation. Um, the endowment ones stay forever. The foundation ones are active for that financial year. Um, so you can see um, most people do want to be named, um, especially if it's a foundation, um, which is which are probably the people that we would overlap mostly with are the, the, the trust and foundations. They almost all want to be named. So you can have a, a look there. Um, that might be a useful place to start. Um, also, you know, if there is somebody that you want to, to check if we have a relationship with, um, then then you always can, but um, it's just legally, it's a little tricky for us because of the the um, personal identification information, right, um, that we can't just share. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you all ever do joint fundraising with, with affiliates? affiliates? Um, we have in the past, um, or um, an affiliate will be fundraising and we might um, come and, and support in some way um, and, and you know, bring people along that we know that you might find, um, you know, useful introduction. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But that's something that we can definitely talk more about. Does anybody else have any, oh, anything uh, you I wanted to? Yeah. Uh, that uh, that is something because I I was talking a lot about that we led with Wikipedia, but a lot of times that is an issue because then we people we realize that the people that are interested they they are looking to support. Wikimedia Foundation. So there were a few times that we we had to guide them 
obviously to the right place for them uh, but it's I think that there is some overlap and we realize that we really need to build our case for support our different cases so that we could explain what Wikimedia Sweden how it's different from Wikimedia Foundation so that we and we also sometimes have to lead with we know that you might have been especially when it's big donors that we we know that you might have prior contact with with the um, Wikimedia Foundation, but this is Wikimedia Sweden, so just let us know if you're not interested for that reason, but so that we are in the beginning uh, highlighting the fact that we might, uh, they might have been, they might are, they might be in contact with Mi Wikimedia Foundation, just so that there are no confusion, so, but that also could lead to very good com uh, conversations. But yeah, I have, we, we do have the same issues at certain points. Hi, um, yes, Kristen from Wikitongues. I do not have a question, just a comment and a recommendation um, based on this conversation around CRMs. Um, I know CRMs are very expensive, as you pointed out. Um, so if you haven't, we use a platform called Airtable, and I just want to give them a shout out because they have been amazing for us over the past like eight years. So they are a cloud-based platform for sharing and creating relational databases. So they're not specifically geared towards CRM in fundraising like Salesforce is, but you can create a very well-rounded CRM through that. Um, and so we, we host our archive on there. We also have a CRM. We do our fundraising, all of this. And the, the pricing is much more affordable and available for those of us that are smaller affiliates. So I think for there's a free option. Um, but I think for professional plan, it's like 8 or 10 euro a month or something. And they also do nonprofit pricing, so you can reach out to them. Um, and so they have templates for CRMs that you can customize, so it's very user-friendly. There's a back-end also if you're good with coding and want to build something out. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, they're really wonderful, big recommendation. And if you need help setting it up, you can reach out to us because we love them. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Airtable, A-I-R table. <laughs> and how can people reach out to you? Do you want to share your? Oh, sure. Kristen at wikitongues.org. And I'm on Meta's something through WikiTongues. <laughs> Thank you. That's super useful. Pass the. Thank you, Freddie. Uh, yeah, I have a separate question, Mikola, Wikimedia Ukraine. Uh, so, like we discussed, like sharing CRMs is difficult because privacy laws and so on. Also, is there a way, for example? If there is like some effort to mutualize, can we mutualize, for example, like payment processing systems? Mm. Because it's like a two-way street. It might be like too costly for each affiliate to sign like their own contract for like different payment pr processing options. And on the other side, we know that foundation is like bad at supporting preferred local options in some countries. So it's like a two-way street where we can share like what works better in each country. And vice versa, like make sure we don't sign like ten contracts with same different versions of, let's say, like su supporting PayPal or whatever cross national provider. Thank you. Can I ask when you talk about um, like a joint payment processing system? Um, would you, are you envisaging something like a, a lot of affiliates join together and and sign one contract with? With someone. For example, yeah. I don't know exactly how we can figure out the details. Yes. But I'm just asking like if that's something that you thought about or we we somebody like tried to Um not that I know of. Um Peter might have more information on on do you, uh, just there's one right behind you. No um sorry. Could could you sorry, hand him the mic. Thank you so much. Um I don't know about mutualizing, uh, like sharing payment providers, but if there are payment providers in, in your country that you feel it would be beneficial for us to add, do reach out because we will look into it. We're undertaking a program, our fundraising tech team at the moment are undertaking a program which should make it easier to integrate new payment methods. So like, I can't promise anything, but we'll certainly look at trying to add new payment methods that you, you think are missing, like we've added ideal in the Netherlands, PICS in Brazil, a bunch of other things in, in Latin America and India. 
recently. Um, so yeah, we can look into it. I'm so glad that you came to this session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, did you have something that you no, wanted no, to say no, on that? So, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? We had some other ideas of anybody um, storytelling, what work, what's worked well in donor outreach for you. I'd love to hear if anybody in the room has something that, and um, we've heard um, from Jenny what's worked well in Sweden. Or does anybody have a successful campaign or not successful campaign that you'd like to share something that you've done? Love to hear. Oh, Freddie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have many unsuccessful stories. <laughs> um, years and years of unsuccessful stories. Fundraising is lots of no's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I think the one that stands out, stands out the most to me is uh, we've tried to stand up some kind of end of year Giving Tuesday aligned sure. campaign. And uh, we have tried I think specifically on the storytelling side of stuff, we've tested out so many different forms of messaging, and it's it's really interesting to hear people's association with the Wikipedia, right, and their interest. To, but then they're like, wait, this isn't that, right? Um, so a lot of uh, calibration, uh, like endless calibration, um, and I think from our perspective, something that I'm avidly interested in, in, in figuring out is 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 there a a loop uh, in analytics or something like that? Is there some kind of data stream that would allow us to at least improve our rate of learning, right? So that we're not so in the dark uh, from one campaign to the next. I think that that might be just an experience uh, matter. Um, but Can might I generalize. ask when you say that you're in the dark from one campaign to the next, what is it that you're looking for? Performance. Um, I think we're not even at least I'll speak for myself, uh, not super comfortable in the analytics, uh, in the, in the mm. engagement, in the conversion, in the, in the funnel, um, to be able to understand at what point is it the messaging that's breaking down? Is it the yeah. UX of our donation flows that's breaking down? The emails are not reaching, you know, there's all of these, um, the minute you convert into data, then you can start having substantive conversations, but we never get there. That's interesting. Can I ask in the room, do other people find that that's something that you are lacking analytics to, to know how your campaigns are performing or where you're losing people? Is this a common experience? Yeah. Um, that, you'll use taking notes so that we um, are capturing all of this, but that's a really useful thing to, to understand um, that is a struggle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is something for Jen, 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 Jen yes. Um, how do you like manage like face-to-face -face fundraising? Because uh, if you need to centralize them, how do you manage them? And also offline fundraising campaigns, uh, then it might be similar to how you can manage campaigns that have a target audience that is maybe off the online grid. So, uh, so. How do you how do you mean what uh, can you how do you manage um, fundraising campaigns that are not online for example like you mentioned face to face as yeah. like a, a rudimentary start but then there might also be you might have a target a target audience that is offline or of the of the of the grid something like yeah. that do you mean the technical side how do we get the f people into our system or the the members because I mean we this is the part of the problem because we haven't had a full-scale CRM system which has made it really difficult but we have if, if you're looking at the technical side we had the tablets uh, that the recruiters used and we manually lifted them into the payment system so that they could be yeah so the, that the people could the donations could uh, go through uh, is that what you mean, or? or yeah, that, it has answered that because I was looking at a scenario whereby a, a target audience is willing to donate, but then uh -huh. they are not online. Yeah. Or they are in, in a rural area without 
the infrastructure, something like that. Yeah. But you mentioned using tablets. Maybe you you customize a tool that can be able to track exactly. the donations. We customized yeah. the tools. So we had we, in the beginning we had forms, you know, paper forms, that we we used, and we. Unfortunately, now we were in Stockholm, in Uppsala, which is very close, so we we really need to find the tar target audience in, in other regions of Sweden. But that is uh, an issue that we can't be everywhere at once. But I do think that there are so many people that want to donate that are not, not necessarily online as much as, even though we are an online <laughs> medium. So I think that we can find people. Great, thank places. you. Uh, we actually are at the very end of our time. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, sorry. Uh, you can reach uh, Yulia at the email address there, um, and she can pass it on to any one of us. Um, thank you so much for coming to this, and I hope it's been useful. And thank you to everybody for uh, speaking, and to Peter as well. And to all of you for asking questions. Thank you. <laughs>